Yeah, very good. No, and that's, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm excited to chat with you all tonight. Um, there's been a lot of different questions that have popped up in Facebook and in other, other mediums that uh, made this really relevant, which is pretty funny because I think we, uh, I think Gene and I talked about this like 18 months ago. So it's uh, been a good long time uh, brewing. Uh, and since I didn't win the Powerball uh, last night, that made my schedule fully available to uh, to chat with you all today. So with that, um, definitely big thanks to Max, the leadership team, all of the volunteers. Uh, obviously, we would not be able to run this club without all that help and support. So kudos to all of you. So with that, let me get myself set up here and come back. I need my presenter view first. I need my console here. Hang on. Can everybody see? Okay. Yes. Brilliant. Means I've not made any mistakes yet. They will happen. All right. So tonight we're going to talk about, uh, about managing your files, managing your pictures, and a whole host of side topics. And uh, as Max alluded to earlier, I am more than happy to nerd and geek out with anyone on here that wants to. Um, I do have a limit in my knowledge and expertise, but the great part about this group is there are probably plenty of other people who could fill in the blanks. Um, so I highly encourage and appreciate questions. Uh, I tend to try and speak slowly to allow people to interject. So by all means, please stop me. Uh, you won't throw off my pace. It's not a problem. And uh, from there, we'll jump in. So uh, we're here to talk about best practices and we're gonna cover about a half a dozen topics. Uh, we'll start off with, before you even take any of your pictures, how to import and catalog, export your images and being able to find them after you've exported them, uh, local storage and local storage options, backups and offsite storage, uh, and lastly, uh, we could really nerd out on this, data integrity. So with that, we're gonna talk about routines. Do you have a routine? When you go out and shoot, do you have everything planned or do you do something like I do and just grab your bag and run out the door? So um, we use recipes in the kitchen so we can get the same consistent results. And so I'm encouraging here to help you develop your own routines and your own habits create that muscle memory and things become automatic. That way you can avoid simple mistakes and get the results that you're looking for consistently. That said, even with routine mistakes happen. Uh, a couple months back, I get asked to shoot senior pictures for my son's swim team. And of course, I'm working and I've got to go run out. And so I grab my bag and everything's in there and I get there and I know that these are going to be central graphic designers, so I need to have a backdrop that I can drop out in Photoshop relatively easily and uh, not have to spend a lot of time editing that and uh, take pictures of 15 kids, grab my stuff, run back, go back to work, finish working the rest of the day. That night, log in to uh, edit the photos, get them over to the graphic designers so they can be printed, shot them all in JPEG. Not terrible. I, I, I am a 50-50 JPEG raw person. Uh, the problem was when I picked up my camera, uh, it, the last time I'd used it was a few days prior shooting football at night under the lights. And I'm not an auto white balance shooter. I am a Kelvin lighting shooter and 4,000 Kelvin shot in broad daylight does not look very good. And so the kids had a wonderful blue tint to their skin. Um, that said, you can still fix it. And, you know, at the end of the day, it worked out. And so I, I got lucky. But I didn't follow my own routine. And so part of that here is to try and help you all build your build one as well. So a couple of caveats here. There are a million ways to do this right. Uh, there are definitely some ways to do it wrong. Uh, no way is right for everybody. And so I'm sharing what I do as a sample. Uh, and so questions and things like that pop up, by all means, let's, let's interject. So this is what I attempt to do. And I do it mean attempt because I just showcase my own shortcomings here. Uh, one of the first thing I do is ensure date and time are still accurate. Um, I know a lot of people shoot multiple bodies. I'm one of those people too. And some get used more frequently than others. And the ones that use frequently are usually accurate. The ones that sit on the shelf, um, sometimes the batteries drain down completely and, um, and it resets. So 
the reason why that becomes effective is that it allows you to then sort by EXIF data at a later date. So you can sort by the date and timestamp that's actually on the image. Another tip uh, that we do is avoid reformatting the cards. A lot of people when they're uh, when they're new to shooting or, or, or relatively um, uh, um, focused, they, they want to reformat their card every time they go out to shoot. And um, that is okay. However, you're not using all of the space on the card and flash memory has a read write life cycle span. And so part of that is we're going to get in the routine of actually filling that card up to close to full before you reformat it. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and when you do actually get to full, you want to prefer to format to erase that card versus just deleting files and folders. Um, we can get really, really technical about how memory is written and read write cycles. Uh, but I think most of you can probably just be satisfied with uh, if you're going to erase formats, your best option. Uh, the next thing is to use cards that are an appropriate size. Do you really need a 512 gig or one terabyte card? Some people do. Uh, that said, the, uh, the example we're going to walk through today, I went uh, on holiday for 16 days and shot to 2,400 images on a 64 gig card. Well, two, they were just redundant to each other. And I still had about six gigs remaining when I got back. So more, like I said, we're going to talk about cards later. The last thing uh, I'm encouraging is to create a new folder on your memory cards, ensuring that you have enough space available and add folders based upon your need. Um, as an example, when I, uh, when I go on vacation, I'll add a new folder every day. Or if I change cities, I'll add a new folder because sometimes I'll be in multiple cities in the same day. Um, you could do it by time. So if you were... Uh, at uh, a wedding and you wanted to shoot the ceremony and then you wanted to shoot the reception and then you wanted to shoot the after party, you can break it up. So whatever works well for you. And I believe most people know how to check the space remaining on their cards uh, by pulling up the, you can either pull up the format menu on Canon and Icon. I don't know Sony well enough, uh, but I'm sure some people can chime in on that. But there is an ability on most cameras to be able to check to see how much space is remaining. So we're going to walk through a case study. There's nothing like real world experience to give an example. So uh, I've shot 2,000 images. Now what? Uh, and in this case, it's actually 2,400, but close enough. So again, I, and I'll keep hitting the disclaimer. There's lots of ways to do it. And so if you found a way that works well for you, please share with the group. That's how uh, learning is, is developed. By all means, please do. So. I'm not a fan of importing straight into any type of software. You can do it. It's, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, it's just not my preference. And so it's one of those things that you'll get arguments for and arguments against. There's really not a wrong way. My preference is not. My preference is to bring my files into my disks first and do that. So as start of that, when I'm, when I'm bringing files in, the first thing I'm going to do is, as mentioned on the prior slide, is I'm going to build out multiple folders. Uh, for something they do. If I'm shooting a sports game, uh, I'll, sh I'll add a different folder for every quarter or every half, depending on the way the game's cut up, because it's easier for me when I go to edit. Uh, and so as part of that too, you want to do your file structure, whether you're Mac or Windows, um, doesn't matter. Um, I, I choose chronological. My brain's wired that way and it works really well. And I can usually remember uh, well enough to say, oh, that was in 2020. And I can go into 2020 and dig through the folders and look for it there. Uh, in addition to that, my recommendation is all of your subfiles have uh, a chronological component as well. And so my way is I do year, month, day, and then a description of what's actually in the file. So as highlighted there, 2022, 11.1, BPC file management presentation would be a sample file. Uh, for those of you that are hybrid shooters that shoot video and pics, I separate out my video clips because I found they get lost if they're intermingled with my pictures. And so I actually just have a, a, a mirror image structure for video, which I shoot far less of. I usually use my phone because it's a little more convenient for me. Um, but uh, I found that that works really well as, uh, uh, too. Um, this... I will tell you is more gospel. We talk about ways that are wrong to do things. Uh, please do not cut 
your photos from your card into your disk. Please copy. And the reason for that is if you have any type of interruption, power surge, USB port ejects the disk, all different kinds of things, you're going to wind up with corrupt data. And you'll probably recover most of it, but there's no guarantee. Uh, if you copy it, you leave the data intact on the card and you're always able to change it again. So your computer treats it differently on copy versus cut. So please copy. Uh, and there's a lot of questions that came up about that, about um, SSD disks versus hard disks. We're going to talk about that later. Each has its place. I use both uh, as Max and Jerry and I were, were, were alluded to earlier, like th there's benefits to both, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And I think I already highlighted that. Um, I'm an Adobe user. I know we have Topaz users, Capture One, a number of other softwares. I'm an Adobe user um, and I'm more of a heavy Lightroom user than Photoshop. Um, there are benefits to importing straight into software, particularly if you have older versions and need to use DNG converters to convert raw files. But when importing straight into any editing software, it's a higher resource load. It will take you longer. Um, it, it, it's just not efficient. So, hey, Derek, just a quick yeah. question. Do you have sure. a structure underneath your 2020 picks, or do you copy all your picks into those specific folders? It's like I paid you money to ask that question. So, uh, <laughs> so, so with that, um, and I use this as my uh, a screen grab of my 2018 files. Um, and I have a couple of swords to fall on along the way. Uh, I follow that structure, but you'll notice that there's a three digit number, file number ahead of that. And that goes back like a decade plus ago when I used to use Nikon's um, import software. And um, at some point I have to abandon it. I just have not done that yet. So I still actually have a, a sequential three digit number in front of it. It's probably when I hit that fourth digit that I'm gonna have to abandon it. So. Uh, I'm not recommending that. Don't do as I do in that case. So, uh, but yeah, so that, and that goes back to uh, uh, the second bullet point under under part A. Um, I, I, I tried to do that. And we'll talk a little bit about nesting files, like Jerry mentioned. So you have a, a root file and then a nested file underneath it. It's okay to nest, but don't nest too deep. You'll lose, you'll lose your, your files. So with that uh, picture, is worth a thousand words and video is worth like 10,000. So this is actual uh, real-time import here of what I'm talking about. And uh, apologies to my Mac OS users here as I stare at my MacBook Pro sitting next to me. Uh, this was done in Windows. So on the left of your screen, you have uh, a memory card. On the right of the screen is the Explorer with all the drives. Um, you can see that there are uh, multiple drives attached to this. That's not even the full load. I had to cheat and do this on my other laptop because it has the video capture software. So this isn't actually on the desktop that I usually edit photos on. So as part of that, I, I mentioned earlier that build folders for each uh, for each one. So here I've got 11, 12 different folders uh, for different days throughout the trip. And I've got them built out basically by day and, uh, and, and, uh, and location. Concurrently, as I come into the drive here, I'm gonna build out mirror image folders to those things. And I'll pause here. And so you'll see them on the bottom or middle right that I basically have my sequential file name, which I don't recommend, year, month, day. I haven't put the description in yet because I don't remember as I'm importing what's actually in those folders, but I will do that later. So at this point, it really just becomes an issue of, and I'm gonna speed this up because we don't need to watch it in, in slow-mo. Um, it's really a copy paste function as you go through and uh, you'll wanna basically ensure that the file transfers completely. Windows does a nice job of actually giving you a confirmation that there were no errors. Mac does as well too, uh, but you wanna watch that. Um, concurrently, uh, in both both those OSs, you can copy multiple files concurrently. You don't have to wait for it to finish. Uh, it will slow down your transfer speeds a little bit. So um, if you're offloading 60 gigs, which is what this is, um, it, it'll take uh, a fair amount of time. So as part of that, uh, you're, you're going to want to think about that. 
as this is kind of running through, I want to talk uh, about a couple of things that uh, seem to be uh, uh, um, a good topic. So we talked about solid state disks and hard disks. So SSDs are solid state, uh, hard disks are the little spinny platters. Um, I work exclusively on solid state. That's my preference. Uh, I treat myself and upgraded all my disks years back and continue to use that. That said, my local backups are hard disks. And the reason for that is cost and efficiency. It, uh, for what I use those for, uh, they can absolutely go and be a hard disk and they work great. And they actually bailed me out last week. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we get to that section. So, so as you can see here, just running through and we'll, we'll jump ahead because we don't need to see, you can ultimately get multiple file transfers happening at the same time as you see here, and bring all your files. On. So now. Hey, hey, Derek, we're getting some questions, and I thought maybe rather than having people type them in, um, they could ask. Yeah, so, definitely. So, um, Gene, Gene, do you want to ask your question on the creating the initial folders on the chip on the camera? She's muted. She may be yeah, left. That's okay. Yeah, I see. I opened up the chat window here too, Liz. Thanks for calling that. I up. think what she's asking is, does your does your camera create those subfolders, or do you create? Yeah. Them? So in uh, um, in Canon and Nikon, and I can only speak to those two. Um, I used to shoot Nikon. I, I um, every now and then dust it off and still pull one out. Um, when you go in, there is an opportunity to start a new folder uh, in the file system menu on your card. So your existing card can be in there and it will ask you, do you want to manually reset to add a new folder? And so that that's the mechanism that I use for that. Um, yeah, and so thanks Don. So Sony does that as well. And I know Nikon does too. I'm pretty sure Pentax and Olympus do that too. It's, it's pretty commonplace. It's usually one of those functions that's buried though. And so most people miss out on it. And that's one of the reasons why I spent a little bit of time calling it out because it's a, little thing that makes a big difference when you're offloading uh, a lot of cards. So I know, you know, a number of folks here went on uh, on photo safari in Africa uh, a few months back. That would be an ideal time to add folder after folder after folder, given the variety of things that they got to see and do uh, during that adventure. And then you're saying when you get back, you save all those cards like a hard drive. And then you come and put them on your computer and you put them in two places and two different hard drives on your computer. Yeah, yeah. You're, um, I'm going to get into that even more right um, right now. So we're, we're going to talk through that. But let's, um, I, I can tell you. One, I can of the other, you. one of the other questions is there, Derek, is what's what's your protocol for, protocol for naming when you have multiple bodies that you're using? Uh, that's funny. I'm going to, let me jump out here real quick. I'm going to jump out of the presentation because I do do that. Um, and so I can show you uh what i do so i think i'm just sharing the monitor itself so come on google there it is there's my x google thank you so uh you all can see this i think right now so here's an example and i apologize for the small font so i shot a football game with two bodies and so i actually just put the the moniker of the body at the tail end. So I shot, this was my 7D Mark II. And so I just put a 7D at the end and kept the naming convention the same. And then this I shot with my R6. So I just added that to the end. And I find that that helps me keep it together. So I know that those are both the same game, but just different bodies. And I, I use the same convention that you do in terms of date, time, or date and, and thing. But when I do my bodies, I make a subfolder within the higher level folder and name the body that I put the the image oh very that that's a great idea too i'll have to try that one time so and then the topic of nesting uh too I, as long as we're i'm sure sharing this um and i'm going to come to this i'm going to talk a little more i always export nested into that root folder so that way whatever my selects are that i picked uh i can always go back in and find them because they're they're rooted back is data files that are part of the recovery i had to do the other day oh look we got bit rot too we're going to talk about bit rot later. That's bit rot. So, um, 
And do you ever oh. make sure that your your raw and JPEGs in the same subfolder? I don't. <laughs> I don't. So I can show you that too. Uh, so I was out at uh, Gainesville Raceway shooting uh, um, shooting drag races back in the springtime, and uh, which is a lot of fun if you if you get the chance. And uh, so I know that was springtime, so I can look here. So here's I have two different folders. So I have um, the raw files as part of that, uh, and I just label as raw. And then I, I do a separate folder with the JPEG backups. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but if you load them both together into Lightroom, Lightroom will load the JPEGs as a sidecar file. Oh, nice. And so you can select whether you want to work with the JPEGs or the, or the raws. Right. But you can, it, you can have them both in the same subfolder and they won't duplicate. Yeah. And Roxanne, let's see, I, I, I feel you. As I was sharing with the team earlier, too, uh, um, I am like a 9 out of 10 on Windows expertise. Um, I'm probably realistic at 10 out of 10, but I have, to, I have to have some level of knowledge that I know I don't know. And I'm like a 5 out of 10 on Mac OS, which is actually, I spend 10 hours a day working on Mac OS, which is kind of ironic um, for work, <laughs> for, for my job. So, But I am a diehard Windows user uh, in, in personal life. Um, I think we hit uh, all the questions that are up there right now. And if you guys want to keep putting them in the chat, I'm more than happy to have that up. I have a window open on that now, so I can keep running with that. My folder over here. One second, I got to re get my console set. And full screen. All right, so we're going to run another video clip here. So this is bringing images into uh, Lightroom. Photoshop, et cetera. So I've got all of those. That's my son graduating from Florida this past spring. Thank goodness for tele-extender lenses and a 400 millimeter because uh, you got to be up in the cheap seats. And so as part of this, um, you'll see that uh, it's the same file structure that we're looking at the drive off here on the left. And um, Lightroom made some changes, I think probably a year ago, uh, where you can actually do multiple folder imports at the same time. You used to be limited to one at a time. And so uh, I'm a big fan of efficiency. And so you can just highlight them all at once. And then because you've already built your file structure, you don't have to do anything other than add them to the catalog. You're not moving them. You're not converting them. You don't have to do anything else at that point. And that's assuming that you don't need to um, convert as a DNG file. Um, we could talk separately about that if somebody wants to throw that in the chat and we'll talk about DNG conversion. Um, that's probably not what people want to hear, so we'll skip over that. So you can go through and you can you can start to bring, uh, restart the video, um, you can bring all those files in concurrently. So as they're importing, um, you're just watching the progress bar on the upper left go. So at that time too, what I'll typically do is go into my cloud backup and make sure it's running. And so while it's importing up there, I'm going to go down to my, my cloud console down at the bottom and hit it and, uh, and make sure that, all right, is it doing its job and running the backups concurrently while this is happening? So, and the reason for that is if you don't back up while you're thinking about it, it's always that thing you can forget about. And when you need those backups, uh, it could be quite painful. And the cloud backups are Adobe or the cloud backups are something else? Um, there's lots of choices. Adobe is one of them. Uh, I use Backblaze. I'm, I'm preferential to them. I've used in the past, I've used Carbonite. I've used iDrive. We're going to talk about backups as, as part of this presentation as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm partial to Backblaze and I'll even do my quick sales pitch with no commission as to why I, I prefer them. But that doesn't mean they're right for everybody. Um, so, yeah, so all the files are coming in here. And again, this is screen recorded, so it's kind of going at its pace. Um, uh, that's the nice part about most of these backups is it's actually working in the background and you can go ahead and click backup now and it says I'm already done. So it, while I was doing all this during the screen recording, when I originally did this on June 18th, um, it did that, but then it went and found 36 files on my C drive because it backs up my C drive as well. Not just my, uh, it does my external drives, but it also does my C drive. Um, it, it's done all this concurrently. Uh, at the same time, too, I have local on-site storage. I have twin 10 terabyte hard drives that are sitting right in front of me. 
those are my when the poop hits the fan type drives. And they do come into play. They came into play last week when I had uh, this little USB port on this very high dollar SSD external drive go bad. The drive's fine, but the port's shot. And thankfully, SanDisk is sending me a new one under warranty, but the port kept disconnecting on me. And so it needed to go back. Um, but because I have local copies, I was able to spend just hit mirror and allow it to refill a new drive in about seven hours. Um, so this is what I use. There's lots of different softwares out here. This is a freeware um, that's actually, um, I've actually contributed money to the site because I've been using it for a decade plus. And so I figured it was worth uh, $20 for all the people who actually maintain this. It's called FileSync. Uh, it works really well. It can do multiple different things. It can mirror a drive. It can uh, replace. It can compare and contrast. So any type of file comparison you want to do, uh, it can do it for you. So in this case, I ran compare. And what it's showing is it's showing there's 2,389 new files to be added to the backup and 18 or 16 to be deleted. And, uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and let that run its course. And uh, I can even see which files it's looking to delete and go, yep, those were edits I made. Um, those are files I'm no longer using. So they're happy to, uh, happy to get deleted off of the backup. I don't need them on the back of it. So it truly creates a mirror image of, of what you've got. That caveat is, though, with any type of data backup, there's a phrase, garbage in, garbage out. If your files are corrupt, if your files are bad, if your files have data rot, if your files have issues, all you're going to do is copy those same issues over to the other drive. They will not be miraculously fixed. So part of that is making sure that you maintain your uh, current drive in, in a healthy status. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we, as we get through. So uh, I'm going to speed this up because it's not anything exciting to watch, but um, like I said, there's a lot of different softwares out there. I put links in the presentation to what this is, as well as a little tutorial. And uh, y'all are welcome to ask questions about it offline if you want. But uh, I've legitimately been using it for a decade plus with zero issues. <clears throat> so this is basically what we all just talked about. Um, and I just want to make sure that you all had notes because I believe we do a pretty good job of sharing all this information after the presentation. So we talked about the importing, add, don't, uh, don't, don't uh, move the files. Um, a pro tip that we didn't talk about in Lightroom and Photoshop, and I imagine other photo editing software as well, keep the catalog, which is the file structure, not the actual pictures, on the same drive that you run the editing software on. Uh, and the reason for that is there's no need for that data to transmit back and forth through the bus networks on the system. It, it's all residing in the same place. It is, Adobe will tell you this, Capture One will tell you, it's how you get the fastest performance out of the editing software is to keep the catalog and the actual editing software on the same drive. Uh, I see a question in the chat. Marion says, do you use Backblaze for cloud or the physical version? Uh, it is a cloud-based software. Uh, it is unlimited data storage. Um, I have about two and a half terabytes out there right now with them, which, like I said, includes my, my, my picture video albums as well as um, a copy, a full copy of my C drive, my operating system. Um, it's, I think, $60 a year, um, which is... Uh, a small pittance compared to the amount of money we spend on cameras and lenses. Um, so, and we'll talk more in depth about some of the options that are out there. There's a lot of really good ones. That's just my personal preference because I don't want to, uh, I needed more data than a lot of other softwares were allowing. And, um, and it's seamless. It, it, for me, it's seamless uh, from a, from usage standpoint. Hey, Derek, question for you though. You said keep, you said keep your catalog on the drive. Yeah, let's talk about that. Photoshop. But you said not necessarily in photos, but I thought basically you had the photos sitting in all these places with their little catalog. Uh, you can. Uh, it, will, it will perform slower. So the actual photo files rest on a little external hard drive. 
there's a catalog that uh, exists in Adobe. It's called it's an lrcat file dot lrcat, and basically it is the file structure of when you added them to Lightroom. So when we were looking at the video and I clicked add and everything came over into Lightroom, it created a secondary file structure as well as it holds all of your edits. So when you're working on a photo and you're making adjustments and changes, that's all stored in the catalog. It's not stored on the actual photo file. Um, Lightroom is not- Does it also it. store the previews there? Um, I think it does. I think it does too. I'm, I don't do uh, full previews on mine I'm because I'm, I, 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 I stingy with my data storage. <laughs> um, and, and I'm not typically going through photos that quickly that I that I need to have it load the preview instantaneously. Um, but yeah, so it so you you can separate them out uh, and do that. Um, but uh, the the challenge that that creates is that locks you to that machine for that catalog. So you 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 won't have portability. And so some people choose to put the catalog in parallel on an external disk so that way they have more portability. Um, I don't need that, so I, I don't do that. I prefer the speed uh, of, of the software versus um, the portability. What about your scratch disk? Where do you put that? My, oh, like when I'm doing selects? Well, if you, if you went in Photoshop, there's, you can do your scratch drive. You can tell it where to put it. Uh, in order for speed. I didn't know whether you put it in a, on a specific drive or not. Mine's on my, it's on my C drive as well. Okay. Yeah. And for the same reason. So um, about 10 years ago, uh, computer manufacturers started putting multiple drives into laptops, which was new um, and it was great. And so they put the operating system on one drive and they put a storage disc on the other one for videos and photos and whatnot. Um, Desktop manufacturers have been doing that for a while as well. That's not necessarily new. Uh, but the whole point of it is to keep that data drive just purely data, no operating systems, no software running on things like that. Uh, and then that way you're just, the only information you're pulling across the bus system in the computer is the actual image file or the video file if you're doing video. Great questions, y'all. Um, we talked a little bit about exporting. I'm going to hit on it one more time. So uh, down at the bottom, apologies, down at the bottom is a sample of the naming conventions that I that I highlighted earlier. And at the tail end, um, in Lightroom, in Photoshop, there's an export to folder function, and you can create a folder. You can create preset defaults and that. Mine are always either labeled either Lightroom export or Photoshop export, and that lets me know. Um, where I did the editing. Um, I'm a very light Photoshop user. I usually hit it from inside of Lightroom because I'm usually trying to get rid of like a telephone pole or a crane that's ruining my my uh, cityscape shot. Um, but that's really about it. I don't, I don't, I'm not a heavy, heavy uh, Photoshop user. Uh, I'm, I'm much more um, sublime in my edits and that's tied directly to my limited talent skill in editing in Photoshop. So, but uh, by exporting to that same folder, it, it keeps continuity and you're able to find those exported files um, pretty consistently. Uh, Heather's got a question. If there's time after, can you show us how you catalog is separated? Yeah, certainly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Gene says, does file sync work with Apple? I believe so. It, it, it actually, I know so. 100% no so. And I did put a link in here uh, for people to go out and read on it as well as a tutorial. So. All right. So what about, there's been a lot of what abouts and I kept teasing it out saying, hey, we're going to talk about it a little bit later. And so we're going to try and bring some of those things to, uh, to fruition here. So uh, SSDs versus hard disks. Uh, let's talk about uh, all the things that matter. Uh, SSDs are about $100 per terabyte. Uh, and that's US dollars for those of you international globe trotting folks. Um, hard disks uh, are a little bit less than $50 a terabyte roughly right now. Um, but prices are dropping for both. Um, at this time of publication, about two hours ago, uh, Best Buy has eight terabyte 
external hard drive for $160, which would make it $20 a terabyte. Um, and that's about a normal price. That's a pretty average price for that, for that drive. Um, I'm gonna date myself and a lot of people on this call. Uh, SSDs don't slow down as they fill up like hard disks do. Hard disks are very much like a vinyl record player of, of yesteryear. Or if you're our kids age, they apparently they love vinyl again and they're paying top dollar for it. Um, so as the needle gets further and further out, it's covering more and more distance to actually write the drive because the speed, the linear speed on the outer side of the platters is slower than on the inside platter. So drives do slow down. Uh, more importantly, when hard drives fill up, when they get to about 70 to 80% full, they really slow down data transfer speeds. Um, SSDs don't do that because they basically write to a grid of cells and there's no moving parts. So, um, as of today, a consumer level, meaning any one of us could buy it, uh, SSD is about two, up to 2,000 megabits per second, megabytes per second. Uh, and transfer rates, you need uh, some special cabling. You need two plus two by two cabling to do that for USB. If you don't know what that is, um, you don't need it. You're not missing anything. Um, with a regular USB-C or Thunderbolt cable, you can get um, 1,000 megabits megabytes um, pretty consistently. Sorry, I've been talking network traffic all day long in megabits, so I apologize for that. Um, hard disks average between 30 and about 150 megabytes a second, so you can see that there's a notable speed difference. It does depend on your computer. If you have an older computer, you're not gonna get those speeds. It, it's simply the motherboards won't transfer the data that fast, that, that will be your limiting factor. Um, SSDs perform better when over-provisioned. We're going to talk about that. The reason I bring it up is because usually you're going to give up 5 to 10% of your capacity of your SSD to be able to use that over-provisioning. Think of it as a buffer, a data writing and deleting buffer. We'll talk about it in a second. Uh, and then the last point that I have here we talked a little bit about, which is hardware, ports, cables, they matter. The details matter. Um, as an example, uh, you can find plenty of USB-C ports, um, which are the new oval-shaped ports that all the phone manufacturers are switching to in a couple of years, thank goodness, it's long overdue. Um, and uh, you can buy a USB-C cable that will work just fine on Amazon for about $6. It will not work any better or any faster than the USB-A, which is the rectangular port that you can also buy for $6. That said, and I'll show this, this teeny little cable that you could probably um, snap in half because it's so thick is a $25 USB-C Thunderbolt cable, which does data transfer rates at uh, uh, 10 gigabits per second. So it's a, which is basically right at uh, um, your thousand. Uh, 1,000 megabytes per second. So it matters. And so when you're looking at hardware, when you're looking at cables, look at what the data transfer speeds are, look at uh, what the uh, the cable is. Uh, if it seems underpriced, it probably is um, not delivering what uh, what what it would expect. Um, so it does matter. For those of you that are, are newer MacBook Pro users, everything's USB-C and Thunderbolt on there. Uh, and all your cables literally um, have zero flexibility to them because they're carrying multiple power leads and multiple data transfer cords within them. Um, they're literally ropes. They're not, they're not flexible at all. Um, and, uh, and, but they work really well. So Jerry's calling out some of the new SSDs can do 3,500, but yeah, it's crazy. They're learning how to stack uh, the data right into smaller and smaller cells. And, uh, and, and that's part of the reason why the prices are coming down. Um, but uh, if you have an old machine and are looking for a little bit of a boost, just changing out the, um, the operating system drive, your C drive for an SSD will breathe several years worth of new life into your machine. Um, it's, it's definitely worth it. Um, my 
Backblaze uh, is pretty interesting, and 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 I and I shared a number of their information. And again, I'm I don't work for them, I'm not paid for them. I pay them, in fact, but they publish a lot of the information around drive stats and around drive health. And um, this is they they've started collecting a lot of data around SSDs because consumers are using them more and more. And the failure rates tend to be uh, significantly lower, with the caveat though that they've been in service far less than the hard disk event. So if you see the average in-service age for hard disk here is about 52 months, so four and a half years. Uh, the average age of an SSD that they're backing up is about a year and some change. Um, that said, and I think it was shared uh, in a couple of places, hard disks fail completely. They just stop working. SSDs start getting errors. And when they get errors, two things happen. Number one, it just stops writing to those cells that don't work anymore. And then number two is it will actually give you opportunities to repair in most cases through whatever the Mac OS or Windows utilities to repair and just stop writing to those cells if it's not doing it on its own. So it's a gradual fail versus a large scale fail. Uh, and then you look at the same thing over a period of time here. This is really the last eight years. Uh, the blue line are hard disks and the failure rate based upon age. And the orange line is SSDs, again, based on age, a much smaller timeline period. Uh, but the key takeaway here is about five years. That's a, and, we, and whether it's an SSD or it's a hard disk, five years. At about five years, you have to start realizing you're on borrowed time with that piece of equipment and be prepared to potentially replace it uh, in, in an unexpected fashion. So moving forward, we talked a little bit about backups. Let's talk a little more. So uh, several types, uh, local, so the kind that sit on your, in your house, uh, on premise, maybe at your neighbor's house, maybe in Jerry's closet, um, the cloud, multiple options in the cloud. And then last, my favorite, and I was thinking about this, printing. You know, who doesn't have some photo books and canvases and things like that? So that that's the ultimate backup uh, out there. So local, local is just that. Local is meant for your use and your immediate accessibility to those files without having to download from the cloud or, or many cloud services will send you a full drive that you can use to offload on versus having to download. Um, and uh, they give you um, uh, uh, they give you that flexibility. That's a great question, Gene. I'm going to come to that. Um, so, as part of that, that's what those are there for. I shared earlier that I used one of mine last week uh, because of my I had an SSD USB failure, and so I was able to instead of downloading it from Backblaze, which I could have done, but it would have taken probably ten hours, fifteen hours. Uh, I was able to ghost it over, mirror it over from one of my backup drives in, in about uh, five or six. Um, and so that's the reason why there. I have two because I don't trust anything. I have trust issues. Uh, and so, and they're just mirror images of each other. Uh, and so realistically sitting on my desk here, I have three copies of my photo libraries. Uh, that's a good transition to the cloud. Why do I have it on the cloud too? Because all hard drives will fail. It, it, they, no hard drive, even commercial grade hard drives fail. So you have to be prepared for it and say, what's my plan for when they fail? Um, so Gene, Gene asked, do remote drives that are used frequently last longer? A little bit. So uh, if they're not powered on 24 seven, they'll last a little bit longer. But they do need to be powered on, otherwise they lose data. And so that it's a yin and yang. Uh, if you're powering them on once a month, you're fine. Even once every two months, you're fine. Um, if you're powering them on every six months, you're starting to roll the dice a little bit. Um, but uh, they will last longer because they're just not spinning. And most external drives today, if they're a hard disk, actually the controller in them um, does a soft boot. They go to sleep if they're not in use. And so it, it, the, most of them will do that for you. Most of the Western Digital and Seagate and all the major manufacturers uh, will do that. Um, for cloud storage, I threw the five 
big ones that most people know about out there. So Backblaze, iDrive, Carbonite, iCloud, Google Photo, those are the big ones. Um, each one of them offers uh, different storages. iDrive is a five terabyte cap for commercial or for res, um, consumer usage. Um, you can buy a commercial account. It's way more money than we want to, to spend. Um, Backblaze is in unlimited, Carbonite's unlimited. I've used Carbonite before too, and it's good. I, I just like the interface on Backblaze better. The, they're six of one half does the other, and I think they're about the same price. Um, iCloud has a two terabyte cap. That's it. You you can you can buy up for pro versions, but most the consumer cap is two terabytes, and Google Photo also has a two terabyte cap as well. So, uh, and just for the record, two terabytes is about in my case two hundred and thirty five thousand images, a mixture of raw and JPEG files. And last, I mentioned print your photos. It's so much fun. Uh, I always have to remind myself to do it more and more, um, particularly like vacations and whatnot. I always like to make photo books out of those. It's, it's definitely a lot of fun. It's a way to, for the rest of the family to see it. So it's not just hidden on my hard drive <laughs> for them. Uh, so we have another question. Um, oh, Amazon. That's a, that's a great call out, uh, Roxanne. Yeah, so Amazon does have unlimited storage as well. Um, I forgot to add that in here. So AWS is an excellent storage system. Is competitively priced as well. So I just give enough money to Amazon already that uh, I wasn't trying to give them any more. So, uh, another question uh, volunteer for the church's social media ministry. Most of the photos are posted on social media around the screens or for our services. Should I to use my tablet for editing or should I transfer the photos for computer for editing? You know what? whatever works best for you and if it's the tablet i would continue doing and the the editing software that's in there whether it's an android tablet or an ios tablet uh, an ipad pretty darn good um and lightroom mobile is pretty good too um so it's whatever's convenient for you and easier for you to get those files out to um the social media is, is the best uh, Helen asks, so do you back up your working file, an additional file, and also the cloud all at the same time? Yes. So when I'm importing in, I run all those backups at the same time. And I don't delete the card, as I mentioned earlier. So the card will keep going till it's full. And if it is full, like my vacation photos, I'll pull those cards out and put other cards in and sit on those cards for a month or two. <laughs> because... Uh, I, like I said earlier, I have trust issues, so it's easier just to pull them out. I have about uh, 14 or 15 cards that are working cards that I just keep in rotation. Um, but I typically keep the same cards in a camera uh, right now, particularly because if uh, like I do a lot of falls, a lot of sports for me. And so they're they're high speed cards. And so I keep those in there pretty much the whole time. Um, but uh, but they're only 64 gig. Uh, but then if I'm traveling, I might put the slower cards in there that are 128 gig and, and do that. So, uh, Tim, fellow SmugMug user. So, uh, yeah, uh, SmugMug does also raw, do raw file storage now as well, too. So SmugMug is another great option. Um, and so you, you, they previously only hosted JPEG files, and they now do raw file hosting as well, too. So that's another good call out. And you don't even have to publish those, I think. I think you can let them sit uh in the background on uh on invisible to general web traffic great questions y'all um so i just i popped this in here just an example so this is the the control panel for for backblaze it's just running all the time um i did this on purpose because it was actually when i had to, i had to swap out those drives last week it was it was backing up two hundred twenty five thousand drives and uh there was 213,000 remaining to go. So <laughs> it's, you know, churning away and uh, no, real, no real impact to my bandwidth and or machine usage. So that, that's part of what I appreciate about it. Uh, what about memory cards? So uh, number and date your cards. Um, somebody wiser than me taught me that a decade plus ago. And so when I put a new card into service, I put the month and year on it and, and I number them. And so that way I know if I have an issue with a card, I can pull it out and set it to the side. 
and test it later on, see if it's having any, any errors. Um, but then I also know that when they start getting up there in age that they're likely going to fail. Um, there's a, a lot of marketing that gets pushed towards super high capacity cards. If you're a video shooter, it probably makes sense, sense especially if you're shooting in 4K or 6K or 8K and all the different options that are out there. Um, that said, 2,100 megabyte files, I'm going to get you R5 users. Um, it's only 195 gigabytes. So a 256 gig card is all you need for that. Um, and uh, you, you can get the best bang for your buck out of that. Um, talk a little about heat. Heat destroys flash memory, whether it's a card or if it's a hard drive or whatever. So do your best to protect your stuff uh, from heat. Um, it, it, they are hot. cards in particular are highly susceptible. Uh, and mishandling cards is easy. They break sometimes. And uh, like when you're taking it out of a camera and it snaps in half. And thankfully, you can scotch tape it back together and offload everything out of it before you throw it in the trash. But they do break. So um, the last thing I'm going to recommend is a little bit of, a, a, I would call a pro tip as well. So buy yourself an inexpensive UPS. Um, $50 on Amazon on average for a 300 watt one and plug all your external drives into that. If you're doing file transfers, if you're doing backups and you have a power surge or a power flicker, we all live in Florida, the power goes out for no reason sometimes. Um, it'll save yourself a lot of headache and heartache because your drives didn't suddenly uh, and abruptly power down. That integrity. Um, and I'm going to pause real quick. A couple other questions. Great idea with dating the cards. Never thought of that. Yeah, I, I can't take credit for that. Somebody smarter than me recommended it to me, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, do I use high-speed cards when shooting high-speed sports? I do. I use um, – I am an SD card shooter, so I have the, uh, um, the high-speed 300 meg cards, but I shoot sports in JPEG. I, I And, and – and, Tim Davis and I arm wrestle over this all the time. He is an unbelievably talented raw sports shooter, <laughs> but he has far more patience in the editing room than I do. So <laughs> I am a JPEG shooter in sports. Uh, Dad integrity, bit rot. I actually joked on Facebook that I wasn't going to get into this, but I am going to get into it. So drives are like cars. Uh, they need to be used to stay in good working order. Don't let them sit. Uh, the reason you don't is because the data that's being stored is actually electricity. It's electrons sitting on those disks, whether it's a hard disk or flash memory. It, it, they both leverage electrons. Um, hard disk connection maintain memory a very long time, uh, literally decades without any data loss or integrity. Those are extreme examples, though, uh, and so I wouldn't recommend it for anyone. Um, SSD is only a few years. It's much, much shorter. So back to Gene's question earlier about powering them off. Absolutely, go ahead. It's, it's, it's definitely in your favor to not have them electrically powered 24 seven, but do make sure they get powered regularly. So, uh, and which is the next one. Don't, don't keep the, the, the drive running 24 seven unless you're doing a, 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 a RAID or a NAS. And we're gonna talk about that in a second as well too. Um, and as part of that, RAIDs work really well for data integrity, um, a RAID is a multi-bay uh, drive. Uh, there's a good example of bit rot for you. Um, and there's nothing you do. Once, once you have bit rot, it's done. It, 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 it's cooked, there's no coming back from that. Um, RAIDs are a multi-bay drive enclosure. They have a drive controller, which is the brain that actually uh, carries the drives. Um, this is a Synology one. This is about $500 without the hard drives. And if you put a RAID level drive in there, um, Jerry, keep me honest, probably about 200 to 250 bucks per drive for about eight terabytes. Yeah, I was. I have a 14 and I got the data center drive quality. So it was a little bit more than that, but you can get Okay, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the, the, the data center quality drives are about twice as expensive as the just desktop external drives, right. but they're designed to run 24 seven for years and years and years. So 
Uh, and in, in layman's terms, what a RAID does is it makes mirror images of all of your data, but it's doing it in a, I'm going to call it randomized fashion that allows you to hot swap out any drive without losing any of your data. And uh, it's, uh, it's meant to be highly efficient and highly complex, but it is the, um, it is the premium version of data storage. And usually they're network attached as well too. So you can, you can treat it as a cloud and pull your data from anywhere in the world in most cases. Uh, and so there's a lot of advantages to it. Um, we were chatting earlier before we started the meeting. If I, if I have a RAID, I do not. When my two desktop drives uh, set to expire, which is probably the next year or so, I will probably shift to that. But that's only because I've reached a level of data that that's probably the most economical solution for me, even though it's a larger upfront investment. Um, in SSDs, there's a, we talked about a little bit earlier, it's called over-provisioning. Really what it does is it creates a buffer on the drive um, that allows that to become the, just that, the buffer space for reading and writing for the drive. And so it does two things. It actually helps speed the drive up so it keeps the performance high. Uh, and it also increases the longevity of the drive by allowing it to evenly spread out the amount of data it reads and writes to the various data cells throughout the, throughout the disk. So most drives come preset um, around five or 6%. Um, most software that supports over provisioning maxes it out about 10%. Uh, and so you have to keep, I share that because you wanna keep that in mind uh, when you set up a drive that if you buy, in this case, it's a 500 gig drive, you're going to lose 50 gigs to over provisioning. So it's really only going to be, oh, it's even less than that. So 418 gigs, because uh, I have the drive partitioned as well. Um, so of actually usable space, but it's, uh, it's well worth it. And because the cost has come down a lot, um, would recommend it for the, uh, for the increased performance. So um, and to explain how data is written on an SSD, if you guys remember the little kids game of you got to get all the numbers in order, um, th that's effectively what it is. So in, in a regular drive, you only have a little bit of empty space to move the numbers around. Think of over provisioning as giving yourselves a couple of extra empty spaces to slide all those numbers around. And it makes it a lot easier and a lot more efficient. So, oh, great question, Jerry. Heck yeah. Um, over provisioning is only relevant for your boot drive. You don't need to do it to an external storage only drive. Um, there's no benefit, no need. You want you want to use it on your on your C drive on your operating drive. Uh, the great Yoda once said, "The greatest teacher failure is." So uh, as part of that. This actually came out today. Uh, Backblaze published their, 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 their drive study. So in Q3, they had uh, 227,000 hard drives that they, they monitored and tracked. Um, and uh, as part of that, they removed ones that weren't relevant or didn't have enough sample size, leaving them about 226,000 drives. And with that, these are the failure rates of those drives. Um, and you can go out, I linked it in the, in the here, you can go out and see it, it's, it's publicly available, you don't have to have a subscription. Um, and so, and these are hard disks, these are not SSDs. And uh, there's always a correlation to age, um, sometimes a correlation to manufacturer, but it's usually manufacturer from a certain time period. So um, Seagate had a lot of failures in the early teens in the 2013, 2014 era. And so a lot of those drives failed um, sooner rather than later. Um, it's about evened out. Um, yeah, HGST for those of you is, is Hitachi IBM formerly. It's actually known by Western Digital now. So, um, so even though you have HGST on there and Western Digital down at the bottom, it's the same company. Um, SanDisk and Western Digital, also the same company. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of manufacturers with different names and labels, but uh, they're all made by the same 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 company. 
Uh, I missed a question. I apologize for that. Uh, Heather, uh, old school question. I used to have to eject external drives to protect data on them. Yes. SanDisk does not appear to be giving me that option and doesn't send alarms when I disconnect. Is that no longer a thing? No, it is still a thing, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go into show and tell for that. Um, and I'm pretty much at the end of my deck. So let me, let me shift out of that real quick here. Cause that's a great question. So within windows, uh, within windows device manager allows you to control your input output uh, functionality and what that means is all of your peripherals and things like that on your drives disk drives there is up oh, my bad went to the wrong one uh, on your drives and it's actually through your usb There is a function called, I got to find it here. Wasn't planning on talking about it, but it's an excellent question. There we go. So on your, on your devices, you can actually go into power management and it'll say, hey, allow this computer to turn off USB ports to save power. Mine are all checked. No, I don't want you turning off any USB ports. As part of that, in the drives, there's a companion feature, which is under policies, enable write caching on the device or turn off write caching. This is tied back to the eject functionality. And so mine is enable write caching. This means that I need to wait for the drive to finish writing before I can eject. Otherwise, I will have issues with it actually writing everything. If I turn it off, uh, that means that it won't let me eject or won't let me do anything uh, regardless. But it's basically, do you want performance or do you want uh, safety? And um, I, I've chosen performance on mine. And so you should still be able to have down, down low here, you should still be able to eject those, those items as uh as it as it's there so you won't get the alarms anymore i don't think windows does that anymore but it's still preferred to go ahead and eject because if the drive is busy doing something it'll tell you not yet does that answer your question i hope it does except um and thank you um i just can't find where i mean i've right clicked and i use windows as well yeah. So I right clicked on the drive and there's no eject. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. It's usually down in the task bar now. Okay. And so you can find that sometimes if you look at this little arrow down here, and I apologize, it's so small, show hidden icons. Sometimes you need to go up in there and find the safely remove eject media button and, and you can drag it down into the task bar and lock it in there. I just pulled the zoom one down as an example. But sometimes it's hidden on that front and so that that's why so you may not see it if it's not actually pulled into the task manager okay thank you yeah. no but it's a good question it's definitely the preferred way and it's it's a good habit to continue to have so it's a great question <laughs> other questions i don't have another one but i'm just gonna re-ask the uh, if you can show the separation of the um catalog from the um, yeah, you bet. Yeah, let me do that. Let me come back and I'll, I'll restart the screen share real quick. So I'm going to find my catalog real quick, too, so that way I don't bore you with me navigating uh, all my files. Ah. <laughs> I uh, I clicked it as it came up here and it opened up a uh, letter for me because that's what it's supposed to do. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> You ought to quit, yes. We get the screen share going again.
I already did. I know where it is now because I saw it pop, but I already hit enter, so I need to bail out of it. There we go. So it's just within uh, within the program files of um, of Adobe is where it sits. That's usually the place where it um, it always would be anyways by default because most people don't start off with an external drive. There it is. So, so it sits here on the C drive, whereas the G drive is my actual pictures and videos. So it's just, it's just nested within the Adobe. Um, you can put it anywhere, to be honest. So you can actually map it from Lightroom. So Lightroom will say, hey, where do you want your, you know, show me where your catalog is. Are you sure that's the right one? Because that one's from 2016. Yeah, it's an old one, but that's because it's, it's the, uh, I'm not in the 64 bit one, that's why. <laughs> And, and while you're doing that, that that does generate, I hope, one last question. <laughs> um, and it's partly because I'm not exactly sure how the um, uh, edited um, instructions relate to the photos themselves, because I've been afraid of separating the two. Yeah. Um, and, you know, can the, can the catalog itself find the photos that are it's supposed to be, you know, is the core of um, the finished product. So I just didn't, didn't know if yeah. that's a thing. <laughs> so it is. And so um, what you're bringing up is um, an excellent point in Adobe products. Adobe products doesn't like, don't like you moving anything, files, file structures and that outside of Adobe. So if you're going to move a folder, if you're going to move a disc, move it within Adobe. You don't want to just go into like Windows Explorer and move it. You'll, you'll break it. You'll break exactly what you're talking about. So you'll miss, you'll lose all of your um, instructions and you can repair it. It's um, intensive and um, not all that fun. So. I never get why people are worried about that. Cause I just make a copy of the, of the image and then I mess with it. I've got I've got one the the regular and then I messed with the other one. Tell, tell, s, s, explain that more. I'm not sure I follow. Well, it's just a personal thing. Like I, I when everybody says, "Oh, you're you're making um, your it's uh, what is it in, in irreparable damage to the image." I don't care. I have a copy of it. I'm, re I'm making a reputable. You're talking about destructive. Yeah, yeah, destructive. That's what I'm going for. I, I'll destruct whatever the heck I want to do. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think the notion is if you put enough work into the image, and, and working off a copy is a great idea. But the the idea is is that you can do things like in Photoshop and do them with layers. So then, if you have to change something, you don't throw away the whole image. You're just throwing away the layer. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I, I think it. At least for me. It's because um, uh, I use Lightroom primarily, and Lightroom doesn't destroy it. It works with the the base doc in the base photo, yeah. um, whereas Photoshop, yeah, you're just you know destroying the original. And I would have a copy there. One of the reasons I like Lightroom is um, copies take up more space, <laughs> and I've been space challenged to date. Um. Yeah, that, that's interesting. But no, even if you go from Lightroom to Photoshop, most of the time it will make a copy for you and bring that copy into Photoshop. Yeah. One of the things so I do is, is since I have 23 years worth of digital images, I keep only like the last three or four years on my internal solid state drive. And I have all the others on an external drive. And if I get if I if I move an entire year from the internal to the external, Lightroom will go, oh, I lost it. And you say, here it is, and you point it to the new 
folder and it just resyncs everything. That's right. Yes, I do that. I do that also. And, and I actually use the same method, Jerry. I've got internal SSDs and then I've got an external as a, a network manager I knew called the big dumb disc where you put all the where you put all the uh, vintage stuff and I back up both. Yeah. But don't you have to pay Lightroom to store all that stuff for you? You do. Yeah, it was a cloud charge. So it goes back to, I think it was Heather who asked. So here you'll actually see there's multiple, I, I found the right folder, uh, it was under Lightroom. Um, so there's multiple Lightroom catalogs, especially as Lightroom does upgrades. So like version 10 of Lightgrade, then version 11. And so it usually asks you, do you want to create a new catalog? Yes, blah, blah, blah. But as you can see, it's a pretty big file. It's 1.26 gig. And, and what that is, that data that's captured in there is all of your edits, all of your settings, everything that you put in there. And that's what it's holding in there. Um, oftentimes when you're exiting Photoshop or Lightroom, it'll ask you, do you want to back up your catalog? This is the catalog that they're talking about backing up. It's backing up and saving all that. And as you see over here, there's a separate folder with backups um, that should probably be in a different drive. It shouldn't be here. <laughs> so uh, I probably need to, to change that as I've been making some updates to my, to my setup here. So, uh, but as a result of that, that's what you're worried about is, is just that is, yeah, you can move it. And I've moved it around before too. And it's like, it's like uh, uh, Jerry and, uh, and Bill said. You just got to remap it, and it usually usually works without issue. But um. yeah, I would add something. You've said this, Derek, but I think it's really really important for the Lightroom users in the crowd to understand that's what is in that catalog is only the edits and only the data that you you know like the keywords and everything else. The image is not in that catalog. So if you're only backing up the catalogs and you lose all of the images somewhere, the, the catalog backups are useless. You've got to back up both your catalogs and your images because they're two separate animals. And sadly, I've heard of some people not realizing that and having some tragedies. I, I have lost the catalog before and had to go back and recreate edits. That's not much fun. Uh, that too. <laughs> Um, there's a question in the chat that uh, Helen and Roxanne said, uh, preference for brands, external hard drive. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, internal, I do. Uh, I am a dyed-in-the-wool Samsung SSD user. I love their internal drives. And, um, and I'm not paid to say that. I, um, <laughs> I, the, so uh, the, the, the drive that's on this machine is uh, it's an 850 Evo Samsung it's probably eight years old and it, like a champ, like a champ. And so, and I have multiple Samsung, I, seven or eight, um, and they're all kicking strong and multiple computers, no issue with that. Um, that said, they've made some changes over the last year or two. <laughs> and, and part of it is they've done that to reduce cost, which is great. I don't know how that'll affect the longevity though. Um, but uh, I use um, Lassie, L A C I E. I yeah. have a, um, a mm -hmm. NAS, which is five, four terabit drives, hot swappable. And I have a traveling NAS, which comes in a rubber case. Um, my roomie in Africa, Max, he's got the same thing. You can bounce these things around, they're pretty good. Um, and I've had that NAS for eight years, and it's still going strong. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, they're they're all pretty reputable. They're all pretty good, and really the key the key factor is name brands. You know, Western Digital, Seagate. Um, you know, uh, you're not gonna have, Sandisk. You're not gonna have any problem. Samsung, uh, you're really not. Uh, a lot of them use the same chipset. So the uh, I actually had to to break a card for y'all um, to uh, to showcase the 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 memory card. It wasn't a big loss because this is kind of funny. It's a 16 megabyte Panasonic card <laughs> from, my, from my first digital point and shoot circa 2001, um, which won't even hold like a single JPEG off of anything I shoot today. <laughs> so, but I actually did have um, earlier this year a, uh, a SanDisk Extreme Pro, which is my go-to SD card, pop in half. 
it's just old. It was it was six years old, so what it, it you know it's been in and out of cameras a, a number of times. So I can't. I it didn't owe me anything, and I scotch taped it together, pulled the data off of it, and threw it away. <laughs> so I would also endorse what Derek says about Backblaze. Jim Brady, who I'm sure most of the members of the club know and respect, Jim. He uh, put me onto Backblaze. So Backblaze backs up not only the computer, but that, that attached SSD, the, the sorry, the NAS. Um, and when you first start it, you wonder if you've really done the right thing because it's backing up over the web for a month to get all your data up there. But then it, it backs up automatically on a daily basis. And it's really, I think it was 90 bucks for a year. I think it was really great value. Yeah, I just I renewed for two years and it was one twenty for two years. Really, I'm paying eighty for iDrive, so I'm going to switch. Hey, yeah. Derek, you did a great job here. Are you, this is a super technical presentation, and very few people bailed. So you, <laughs> <laughs> you would get big time points on that. Wow, that's if that was a litmus test. I feel I feel honored now that uh, you, you all hung out. So. I actually have one more question. When you're um, offloading your camera, do you do you ever use a cable to offload from your card, or do you always take the card out and put it in a reader? So um, previously, on my older bodies, I always take the card out. Um, but uh, I do have on my newer I have a, I, my main body now is an R6, and it has a USB C port on it, and so and I have a nice high dollar six foot long USB-C cable that I usually just plug into. That's but fine. alternatively too, I also have a very nice high dollar USB-C SD card reader um, that, that, that goes as well too. So it, de it depends. Um, I actually charge that camera more often than not through uh, a USB-C charger, through, uh, through my MacBook Pro's brick, because it's a power delivery brick and we're completely going off topic with that. But um, I do that. Um, it is, it is Max smiling. He knows what I'm talking about. Um, so I do that too. And that's like when I'm traveling, it's one less charger I have to bring. So I literally already have to have that charger. So I just charge my camera every night. It takes a wee bit longer, not much. Yeah, I just didn't know whether you would do that. It's I know it's not quite as fast as maybe a direct card reader, but yeah, it, it keeps you from having to handle it. It does, right. And that's why with the USB-C, I'm good. Because the USB-C can, can do... The tra max transfer rates uh, of the actual card reader, um, but before before that that body, like my old body has a USB 3.0 on it, uh, which is rather slow compared. Um, so either one is six one half dozen the other. Okay. Yeah, but it's it, I, I I it goes back to my strategy of I buy great cards. Um, I'm a big fan of the Sandus Extreme Pros. I've had one failure. Uh, in, you know, and that was the card that split in half, <laughs> one failure in about 10 years. Um, and uh, I just like them and they're a good bang for the buck and B and H and Amazon put them on flash sales about eight times a year. So when I'm, when I see it, I usually buy one before I need it. So. Thanks, if I could break in here, I think we're approaching 7.30, and yeah. this has been a fabulous hour and a half discussion. Derek, uh, yeah. I I have so many pages of notes on my notebook, and I know I'm going to have to go back to the recording to make sure I got it right, but I'm trying to absorb an awful lot, and I really need a beer to decompress. Uh -huh. I'm, good heading call. To, I'm heading to Mavis. Hey, but on that note, Jerry, where if people have been asking, where is this going to be? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be on the YouTube thing. Does it link from Wild Apricot? Can you tell us about that? Where is I, where is this program going to be? Yeah, the recording. Where's the recording. Okay. Where's the recording gonna so be? what we do is we take this recording and I create a, a video out of it. I upload it into YouTube. And what is on Wild Apricot in the... Um, I'm trying to remember what page it's on, but there's one. I think it's um, library on the library page. There is a link to all our wild apricot recordings, one for the programs, one for the slideshows. And if you click on there, it brings up all the recordings in a in a in wild apricot, and you can choose the one you want to watch. Yeah. It will, when, it's, when it's uploaded into YouTube. 
You can either go to the YouTube channel to get it or to Wild Apricot to get it, either one. And you need a couple of days to get it ready or how, how, when will it be ready? Uh, probably a day or two because I have to convert it and then generate it and then upload it. Okay. You know, and Liz, you could always attach it to, I mean, if you've got an event for the meeting, you could always also put the link there. That's true. Good. Okay. I'll leave them, allow I more. To kill them, but I'll, maybe I'll start leaving them alive. Okay. And I typically will do that too when I when I post it. A lot of times I put the link in Facebook. Yeah, and I can I can send you all the presentation if you want to, um, and um, export it out if you want. Anyway, I'll just put it on my Google Cloud if if people want to. I like it with this, with what you're talking. It, it's easier to understand what you talk about. You're, you're yeah. doing great. Yeah, and it's got my notes in the in the notes sections too. If you all want, and, you know. One of the great that would be great this presentation. I think Derek is it's something that everybody can use regardless of what their camera is, and so right. it's really one of those things that hits a lot of uh, the members and, and things they want to know. So thank you for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. No, I appreciate you guys. And I love the questions that made the time fly by for me. So I appreciate the interactiveness. And before we go, we have to give him a big, another congratulations for his first place win in the annual competition in people. And we oh, hope God. to see you next month at the December 6th meeting when we have the ceremony for the win. I will be there. With, I will be fresh back from vacation and I will be there. Great. Well, again, thank you so much, Derek. This has been a wonderful presentation. And thanks, Liz, for getting this organized and Jerry for making it happen te with technology. And for everyone else, thanks for joining us and have a great night. And we'll see you again next month. Thanks, guys. Bye, all. And thank you to Jean for getting you lined up, right, Derek? <laughs> She's good like that. Is, it, is anybody <laughs> going to marry? Yes. I'm heading as soon as I can get my shoes on. Yes, I'm going too. All right. See you there. I'll be there. All right. Good night. You going to bring me a present, Betsy? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>